Thank you very much indeed. Um, absolutely lovely introduction, Michael, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, it's not as if I'm following on from a, a series of lectures given by incredibly uh, clever people, um, <laughs> Nobel Prize winners and so on. However, fortunately, I have something on my side, and that is artificial intelligence, which I think, I hope, will at least augment me. So I can say, computer, please create a lecture for me, please. And you know what the machine is going to say. I'm sorry, Steve. I'm afraid I can't do that. And like many people who sort of grew up looking at films such as 2001 and these malevolent computers, we have really had a love-hate relationship with intelligent machines for a very long time. I came across this poster for Tobor the Great uh, on my youngest daughter's wall, um, a film I fortunately haven't seen. Um, it looks absolutely magnificent. This was in the 1950s, and I think the public perception of incredible, fantastic machines, then, of course, they would have been atomic-powered, um, but these artificially intelligent machines hasn't abated over the decades since the 1950s. We still have a love-hate relationship with these machines, and they have become incredibly prevalent in our society. Uh, here we have the Google CEO, Sundar Pichai, saying, AI is more profound than electricity and fire. So if anybody is alone in the woods and you really need something to cook your sausages on, you will turn to your AI. <laughs> the reality of AI may be subtly different. And for those who are interested in tennis, you can go, and this I did during the US Open, don't find the Federer US Open results. And of course, the algorithm will return and tell you exactly what happened. He lost. Uh, furthermore, uh, you go to your refrigerator to get a consolatory snack and a drink. Uh, but oh no. <laughs> and this is what the algorithm thinks a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks actually is. This doesn't stop. We have very high profile machine vision AI examples where birds and bicycles are unable to be distinguished by even the best algorithms. So they're banned from the competition. And yet somehow, machine learning and AI are extraordinarily big business. And my question is, what's all the fuss about? Is it really all a load of selling old rope? So I'm going to retitle this talk, and I'm going to call it Transformational, Trash or Terrifying, um, which I'm particularly proud of, mainly because they all alliterate, and I'm not very good with words, so, uh, or the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to turn this round a little bit round the other way, and I'm going to start with the bad, because I think it's always good to save the best till last. So the bad thing is if we look at a graph, this is the Gartner hype curve, and we ask where is machine learning, this sits in a region which Gartner called the peak of inflated expectations. These algorithms are like the unicorns, they're like some magic secret source that will take all the world's problems churn them algorithmically and squirt out solutions to all of these problems. The reality may be somewhat different, but I think there is a very positive side. We will fall down to the trough of disillusionment at some point as people begin to realize that the marketeering rather than the engineering around AI has become really rather prevalent. Everything has become AI. You walk through various parts of London, and everybody you see in a coffee shop is an AI researcher. So, what's brought about this alchemy of, of machine learning? I did have somebody at the end of a talk say, you do know that he is professor of potions, not alchemy. Thank you very much. So, uh, <laughs> but it's still. So my, my premise always is that all of these things are mathematics, not magic. All AI, no matter what flavor we 
agree we will use, whether it's more traditional computational statistics, right the way through to the new wave of really exciting deep hierarchical approaches like deep learning, all AI is about understanding patterns that occur within data. It is intrinsically data-driven. There are occasions where the AI creates its own data to feed back into itself. But at its core, these algorithms use the mathematical framework of updating their belief or updating their views about a world model. And they find patterns in data. That can be a very positive thing, but it can also be a potentially rather negative thing as well. I have some constellations here. Constellations really don't exist, and yet we still use them. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a physics degree and specialize in astrophysics, and of course we still use this nomenclature Oh, there's a, it's in the constellation of Perseus. Well, this is sort of a random arrangement of, of stars that the ancients thought looked like something. But this idea of finding patterns in, in data is so deeply embedded in us as human beings that we obviously imbue human-like qualities to algorithms that can tease out patterns from data, even potentially where none exist. One of the areas I work in is in mathematical finance. So if anybody works in that area, they'll know a little bit about some of the, um, the trends people believe lead to particular things happening in the market. One of my favorites is up at the top left. For those who can't quite see that, there it is. This is what was happening with the price of gold a few years ago. And this is a genuine uh, infographic and this is the vomiting camel pattern. If you see the price of gold, do this. It will vomit down and plummet. Why does this work? Well, if enough people believe it and trade upon it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's amusing, I think, for people looking at uh, financial commentary on the news, but isn't necessarily a sustainable technology when we come to try and use these kind of ideas in our computers. Part of the problem is garbage in, garbage out. The big difficulty is we don't always spot it. This, a few years ago, this was a couple of years ago, some people may remember Microsoft's Tay chatbot, which they put online and allowed people to talk to it. Now, people are people. And people are not going to talk nicely with a computer. And in fact, within a day, it had gone from, I'm stoked to meet you, humans are super cool, to chill, I'm a nice person, I just hate everybody. The, the things it said to people after that, I cannot put a slide up, it became absolutely appalling. It was rude, it was misogynist, it was the worst side of human nature. And yet, it has been created by the data that we put in. So one thread that will go throughout this lecture is that these algorithms are only ever as good or as unbiased, as fair and as intelligent as the kind of data that we allow them to have access to. Sometimes we put in data that we believe is legitimate, but we find relationships that are absolutely spurious. Some of my favorites come from the website Spurious Correlations. The correlation between computer science doctorates in the United States and returns of games arcades are incredibly well correlated. I actually think that might be a real correlation. <laughs> I like to think this isn't. This is the divorce rate in the state of Maine in the United States and the per capita consumption of margarine. It's why we only have butter in our house. <laughs> I'm not the first person to comment about the way in which AI is being sold as a solution for a great many problems. And yet, it isn't always able to solve those problems. This is from the MIT Technology Review. This is from Jeff Hinton, one of the great pioneers of artificial intelligence over the last three decades. A real intelligence doesn't break when you slightly change the problem. More of that in a moment. This is the kind of thing that he refers to. Brittle and shallow. 
we take algorithms that perform very, very well on sanitized data, clean data, and we change a handful of pixels in an image. And now, we've turned stop signs into 30 mile an hour speed limits. We've turned 80 mile an hour speed limits into 30 mile an hour. That won't be too much of a problem. But we've turned go right to go straight. As human beings, we have no problem whatsoever in spotting these very slight corruptions of an image are still fundamentally the same information and we should drive accordingly. For a sustainable technology, we've got to overcome some of these problems. Classic ones, which I'm sure many people will have heard of, will be the toaster sticker. This sticker, if you print it in color and place it next to any object, will fool the world's best machine vision algorithms into thinking everything is a toaster. Clearly, this is a banana, but the algorithm believes it is a toaster. One thing that it doesn't help with, though, it actually stops toasters being decided as toasters. And that, uh, of course, can be a bit of a problem in the morning at breakfast. Michael Jordan, obviously not the famous basketball player, but the, uh, the AI pioneer. Artificial intelligence, the revolution hasn't happened yet. There is an enormous amount of hype and hope, but it isn't quite happening. And I think people trying to implement this kind of technology realize very early on that at the edges, it is brittle, and there are failure modes. Stanford AI Review. We are flying blind in our conversations and decision-making around AI. I would agree we are. The use of AI is outstripping legislation, policy, it's leading to societal changes that we, as a culture, are not necessarily prepared for. How do we work with a legislation which takes into account that some algorithms are helping people make decisions that affect people's lives? Not just in terms of credit, do I get a credit card or not, but maybe, do I even get interviewed for a job? So. We move from, these are only bad things, we move to the truly ugly things, where AI is being pioneered in systems where there is real risk. We're very used to hearing about problems with things like self-driving cars. This is a technology that is going to happen, please don't get me wrong, within the next 10 years, and it must happen, because it is safer than us. But when we hurt people when we drive, there is, a, there is a policy and a legislature around that. Algorithms are perceived somehow as things that never, ever go wrong. And we have case after case of where these algorithms, and these are pioneering algorithms being used in a brand new technology, they will go wrong from time to time. And yet we really don't have a way of bringing them into our infrastructure. How can this happen if we have 99.9% .9 accuracy? So a colleague of mine in, in Oxford, Marta Kwiatkowska, has been looking at data sets used to train self-driving cars and looking at the common algorithms that perform very, very well. She found that on average, she only needed to change three pixels out of hundreds of thousands in each image for those algorithms to catastrophically fail. Again, we don't have a sustainable technology to cope with these kind of failure modes as yet. This has been much beloved for several years. This is the MIT Media Lab who played the, uh, the moral machine and tried to get their heads around the way in which autonomous systems imbued with some level of intelligent autonomy should make decisions when faced with a catastrophic decision. There is no positive outcome, only degrees of badness. What degree of badness should I choose? Whose lives should I value? These are deep philosophical questions that we as human beings have grappled with for thousands of years 
and yet we don't necessarily have the answers. But our technology is forcing us now to confront some of these issues head on. Interestingly, France, Greece, Canada, United Kingdom, emphasis on sparing the young. I see a lot of young faces here. Um, I'm very glad you're here. Um, I will be going to Japan at some point in the next 10 years, uh, where, where the machines will venerate me and not uh, decide to crash into me. Joking aside, these are really very important questions. And culturally, we are not quite ready to address them. Certainly, as engineers and scientists, these are not the kind of things that we used to have to deal with. They feel very uncomfortable when we are asked about them. And yet, they are at the core. They cannot be added as an afterthought to the technologies we create. We need to engineer these kind of questions and ethics right into the machines that we build if we're going to have hope of a sustainable technology moving forwards. We live in a world which unfortunately is rife with bias. Not long ago, if you asked a question and looked for pictures of scientists, you would see lots of middle-aged men. The world is a lot bigger than white middle-aged men. Many of you all know that. We live in a world where science is global. We live in a world where people from all ethnicities, genders, contribute to the scientific progress of our society. And yet, the kind of historic data that we have to do with the science that is done, and historically, is incredibly biased. Not just in terms of gender, but everything else as well. It is very, very important when we create algorithms that search through data at scale for us, that we don't amplify cultural biases. Yet we don't have a technical mechanism, quite yet, whereby we can identify these and correct for it. The internet, great though it is, algorithms, amazing though they may be, act to reinforce the bubble of prejudice that we all live in, this clearly has got to change. They are also, these algorithms, taking our jobs right now. My friend and colleague Mike Osborne here and his colleague Carl Frey, in a very key piece of work a couple of years ago, looked at the rise of algorithms displacing people in the job market and estimated that over the next uh, five years, 50% of jobs were at risk from the increased use of artificial intelligence. Some of these jobs we already know are going, roboticized factories and beyond, but some jobs that we may not even think of. Our accountants, our doctors perhaps, with algorithms that replace GPs and so on. This can be very frightening. So much so that some people like Andrew Yang, a Democratic, uh, Democrat candidate in New York, actually went on record saying, all you need is a self-driving car to destabilize society. He wasn't necessarily just pointing to accidents. He was using self-driving cars as a metaphor for intelligent algorithms in general, because they are taking a role in our society that we are not necessarily keeping a pace with. Having led this talk so far in a fairly negative way, I would like to comment a little bit more now about the positives and talk a little more generally about what machine learning is in my view of the world. And I can start by saying if we get it right, there's a variety of things that we can do. They can forecast, they can model, they can quantify risk associated with actions. These are incredibly important. Ever since, people like Pierre-Simon Laplace asked himself, how much would I pay to play a game of chance in a casino? People have been trying to understand why we as human beings take risks, why as we as human beings massively under or over 
estimate the risk associated with things we do and actions and decisions we take. Algorithms don't suffer from these kind of prejudice, whereas we as human beings do. We can deal rationally with uncertainty and partial observations in a way that we as human beings are not evolved to do. We are fantastic at filling in gaps in things like vision, speech, tactile information, and so on. But unless we have data mechanisms which allow us to engage with data at scale using mechanisms we're evolved to look at things with, we rarely make the right decisions about how we interpret uncertain, dirty data. Furthermore, algorithms with enough training can perform at human level in a variety of really groundbreaking areas. Finally, and most importantly, machines are able to work at scales which are beyond human. So, they are a force for good as well as for bad. Bringing them into our society helps us do useful, important things in a world that needs solutions to many global problems. I put up but a few. Please look at all the great stuff for AI for social good. Everything from increasing uh, crop yield in areas of the world prone to famine, understanding water sustainability, and so on and so forth. Trying to understand how we can use high tech to end hunger and famine. Trying to understand how we can stop destroying biodiversity in our world. Trying to understand how we can make better diagnoses to people as individuals rather than categories. How we can take workload away from an overburdened medical profession. These are all very important and very high profile uses of AI. Furthermore, some of the most high profile that we all guaranteed will have heard of, there's even a film about AlphaGo, really set our minds racing about the capabilities of AI. And it's worth pondering when uh, I was first learning how to play Go very, very badly, and never got my head around anything more than the very basics, it was still thought of as a game that nobody would ever computerize. And yet, the world's best Go player, by far, that has ever existed is a machine. How did it do it? Well, it did by playing against itself. What can computers do? They can, they can work on problems endlessly, tirelessly, and at a speed that we as human beings cannot, for all our cognitive capabilities. These algorithms can work at trillions of operations per second, playing millions of games against itself in seconds, more than a human could ever do in a lifetime. And so by this way, algorithms like AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero are able to bootstrap themselves into a position where all they know is about the rules of the game and how good it feels to win. Yeah. They get a reward at winning. And this concept of trying things out in order to maximize a reward is at the core of so much of modern AI. After 70 hours, AlphaGo Zero was already playing at superhuman level. After 40 days, AlphaGo Zero became arguably the best Go playing agent that has ever existed on the planet. So we ask ourselves the question, why can't we simply apply this technology to absolutely everything? In principle, the concepts of how Google DeepMind and their colleagues worked with AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, these concepts do transport. Unfortunately, the world is far dirtier and more difficult than a game. The rules of the game of life change on a daily basis. The rules of Go don't. Stones are white or black, not a gray. Stones are visible, not partly occluded, and so on and so forth. 
we get to see what our opponent plays in a game. So playing games is a start, but it can lead to some very, very impressive breakthroughs. This is an incredible video. This is not a person inside here. This is from Boston Dynamics, who make arguably some of the world's most amazing robots. This algorithm has simply learned from uh, intelligent trial and error, using reinforcement learning, way, and to do backflips and jump over blocks. Clearly, they didn't train it and let it keep falling and break itself. They would train its algorithms in a simulator ahead of time, a realistic mimic, a game that mimics the physics of the real world. But the result is one of the most impressive things that I've ever seen. Equally impressive are algorithms that are able, in real time, to track vehicles, pedestrians, work out where they're going. You can see the shadow of a self-driving car. This is running around the back of the department in Oxford, uh, not crashing into anybody, and comes from my friend and colleague, Paul Newman. These, again, are absolutely incredible. The transformation that's taking place in things like logistics and manufacture, where we're moving towards entirely roboticized factories, where we have uh, whole production lines which are under the control of nothing but intelligent algorithms, trying to move us towards zero fault, zero error production. Ten years ago, if I'd have picked out my phone and started saying, Hey, phone, make an appointment for me. People would have either thought I was talking to a person or I was mad. Now, talking to a device is commonplace. I guarantee the majority of people here use these facilities on their mobile device or a home hub in order to communicate with an AI system. It works virtually all the time. This is one of the most impressive pieces of technology. This technology is automating the process of lip reading. I know we have a, a fine friend here who is translating what I'm saying into sign language. At scale, it's very difficult to do that. It requires people. But if we can have algorithms that are able to do this in an effective, robust and reliable way, we can bring so much more content to the world. What is fueling this huge rise of machine learning? I would argue it's not just about intelligence in algorithms. It is fundamentally to do with the scale of data. The internet traffic in 2017 was approximately two zettabytes. If you compare that to all the printed material in the world, or all the words ever spoken by a human being, and let's go back, say, a benign quarter of a million years for our species, which is a pretty conservative estimate, they are far outweighed by the amount of internet traffic that we are working with right now as a species. Furthermore, we see Moore's law, where the, the scale of computation rises exponentially, here on a logarithmic scale, computers are getting faster and faster, but at the same time, the price is falling all the time. So this is an enormous driving factor. We can simply do so much more with high-performance computing now. Laptops like mine that uh, infrequently fail on me would have been supercomputers 20 years ago, and yet they are a fraction of the cost. There's a really big movement as well to try and have algorithms make less biased decisions for us. This is a lovely bit of work done in 2011 that looked at the leniency of judges in parole hearings for prisoners coming up for parole. And this is uh, the morning, they come in from breakfast, and they're very, very likely to grant parole. As their blood sugar drops, 
they get grumpy and they say, put everybody back in prison. They have a snack and a bit of coffee and it happens again. These kind of things happen across industries, not just judges. They happen in the way we do medicine, the way we trade in our financial markets. Um, I like to think nobody is kind of hitting a bit of a downer now, but there'll be some, there's lovely snacks coming up soon. And I think it's really useful to remember that these kind of things can be removed by good use of machine learning. But I've so far not really mentioned about what machine learning actually is. In my mind, machine learning is simply the study of algorithms that can learn and act. And all machine learning, with a few minor caveats, starts with something whereby we give it examples of success. Digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, or whatever, and we tell it what those digits actually are. We are then faced with some data and asked, the computer then says, using information that's come from its training data, what's the most likely outcome? Ultimately, this is all about learning relationships between what we observe in the world and what responses we should give in response to what we observe. Broadly speaking, all machine learning of every flavor observes data. By some brilliant mathematical machinery, in the way we fit functions, it fits calibrations to data. When we observe something new, we can work out what the response should be. This is all about entropy. Entropy and energy, if you're a physicist, are kind of the cornerstones of 19th century thermodynamics and statistics, statistical physics. I first came across the idea of entropy in a, a Doctor Who episode, Logopolis, where the entropy lords went around the universe trying to stop the heat death of the universe. We are all entropy machines. Owen Schrodinger was the first to vocalize this in his great book, What is Life, many, many years ago. We use energy, we do work in order to stop the decay and disorder of the universe. Time's arrow creates this disorder. And machine learning is no different. We do work, and that work is in the form of computation. That is just doing work on a system to reduce our uncertainty about the variables of interest. And that ultimately is everything that AI is. We turn a handle to do work to reduce uncertainty. How it works is we have a lot of disorder. We observe some data. We reduce our disorder having observed something from the world around us. And so we are better placed to make predictions or forecasts in regions that are close to things that we have seen in the past. This is a generic mechanism for learning from the world as it streams past us and is ultimately at the core of all AI. As somebody who is uh, wedded to probability theory because it forms a rational calculus for the way we work with these things, I'd simply like to say deductive logic, classical logic where we walk outside into the strand and it is raining, even though it's dark, we know that there are clouds up there. We deduce that there are clouds up there. Probability theory lets us turn that around and lets us say, if we observe the sky is cloudy, what is my degree of belief that it will rain on me as I walk back tonight to the tube station? And that degree of belief about whether it's going to rain, conditioned on my observations, can be held by any intelligent agent. A human being, an animal, a robot, an intelligent algorithm, and so on. These are all intelligences in the framework of forming degrees of belief so that they can act, decide, and manipulate the world around them, observing things. Most importantly, the world of machine learning is all about fitting functions. 
we can start with very simple things, which we know and love from A-levels, first year, uh, undergraduate work, and so on, about, say, if we were forced to fit a straight line to data. It works very well for data which is a straight line generated. It works very poorly if the data is more complex than our system. This means that the data overwhelms our simple model. We need something richer. This is the state of play come the 1950s. We've got statistical models like least squares, total least squares, algorithms developed in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. What is amazing about the 1950s, 60s, 70s onwards is the growth of highly flexible models, models which have the capacity to grow in their complexity as needed by the data. I would argue this all started mathematically with things like uh, Kolmogorov theorems, but practically with people like Rosenblatt and the beginnings of neural networks in the 1960s. It's only recently in the last decade we've had computers powerful enough to really work with these. These operate in a very different way. How they operate is that they are bendy. They flex to the data. As the data requires more complex solutions, they flex to it. They don't overwhelm the data. They work in a dance with it. They bend enough to explain what we see around, but they don't bend beyond that. As Einstein beautifully put it, all our theories should be complex enough to explain nature, but no more complex. This is Occam's razor in action. And these kind of models are now the prevalent models. They don't overwhelm our data. We don't force the data onto them. They learn representations, and they distill levels of meaning from the data that we give them. And these allow complex models of complex systems. And that is transformational. One of the examples I will give is of algorithms that can learn from observations to try and work out their degree of surprise when they observe new data. We see some swans. We ask the question, what is we going to see next? I think it would be quite reasonable, especially if this was in the 18th century, for us to say another white swan. We express a degree of surprise when we see a black swan. These black swan events, these rare unexpected events, turn out to be incredibly important. If we can work with that and quantify our degree of surprise, we can then screen the world for interesting new things. And that has a profound effect. In industry, remembering that industry has become incredibly telemetered. Oil production, mining, aircraft, the automotive industry, we create terabytes, thousands of gigabytes of data on a daily basis from simple machines. And we ask always the question, is it working correctly? Is it going to fail? Is my jet engine developing a fault? And so on. AI has the answers to this. It can look at this data at scale, and it can start asking, is there a possible issue here? Can we work with it? Can we automate now to tell our technicians, our engineers, to go out, in this case, into the Australian outback, pack some tools, and go and fix the problem on a gas extraction well in the middle of nowhere? Absolutely, we can. Furthermore, we can actually bring this concept to science as well. Because science, ultimately, is about performing experiments on the world around us, and then scratching our head and saying, oh, that can't be right. That's really weird. Normally, it's a measurement error, or we've made a mistake. But once in a while, we discover brand new things. This kind of technique has been used for finding black swans by using AI to go through 
huge tracts of radio astronomy data, looking for things that go against the known laws of the universe, or at least the known laws learned by an algorithm about all the data that it has seen thus far. And we discover things which are unusual. This concept of discovering things that you don't understand and digging down into them is something which all scientific pioneers have the great pleasure of uh, working in Oxford with Jocelyn Bell, the discoverer of pulsars, and her discovery of LGM1, Little Green Men 1, because she thought it was aliens, was about finding something that made no sense in a radio telescope experiment. We can do exactly the same. And that little blip I showed you earlier, it turned out to be the evidence of a fallback accretion asteroid, the rocky core of something like the Earth that had been stripped apart by a supernova, the star collapsed to become a neutron star, spinning, and formed a pulsar. And what was left of an inner planet formed a, a sad little rocky metallic asteroid, which over a period of several months spiraled to its doom in the surface of a neutron star. This would not have been discovered had it not been for an algorithm to say, there's something here which shouldn't happen according to what we know about the astrophysics of neutron stars. This leads me nicely to the fourth paradigm of science. If we think about the way in which science traditionally has operated, we start with empirical uh, people looking at the world and coming up with theories. The last few hundred years, people develop theories, and they dominantly do theoretical work. We then have decades of computational simulation, and now science has become an effort in taking data. And the actual science of discovering new things and understanding the world around us takes place inside the data. For those like me who started out their lives in physics, in a quote-unquote proper science, this is great because we move into areas like a computer science where we can bring our skills to do with data analytics to bear. And broadly speaking, I'd say there are four really exciting areas where AI is having a big impact. One is in detection and discovery, things that we've just seen like the pulsar. We can learn about principles from data. We can do human in the loop, wisdom of crowds stuff like Zooniverse. In fact, I had the pleasure of working with Luke here on projects to do with exactly that. But we can also get our algorithms to help us perform really effective experiments. And that turns out to be very exciting. Detecting things, I'd say, is the bulk of what we do. It's there in the way we use it to detect planets outside of our solar system. It's used to try and work out that there are weird and wonderful things. Popular science press always likes to say it's alien hunting. Um, you probably have read recently about uh, the, uh this cigar-shaped uh, thing that's extrasolar, uh, extrasolar system. It's a deep space visitor that's come to say hi. And everybody says, oh, it's shaped like a cigar. It's got to be an alien spacecraft. If only, it'd be wonderful. Beam me up. So, um, but these kind of things, again, we can use our algorithms to do. And this has paved the way for so much. Gravitational waves, you know, the subject of part of one of the great lectures which people have had here in years gone by. Gravitational waves were detected as part of a bedding of new instrumentation using algorithms to screen data looking for weirdnesses. And it found colliding black holes. How, how weird is that? It's used in atomic physics, and in a nice kind of bring us back to the progenitor of the very first person who stood here, Peter Higgs. It's also used in the search for new particles, including the Higgs boson. So this is great. The thing that really excites me, as well as learning about laws from data, is actually about intelligent experimental design. Let's think back to that robot jumping over the blocks and the way it worked. Let's think back to AlphaGo playing a game. 
Science is just like this game. It's about making an informed choice about what you think you need next as an experiment, giving it a go and seeing how well it works. So the cycle is, we have some model of the world around us that tells us about where we're likely to learn most. We then select an experiment. Experiments cost in every sense. So we need the biggest amount of knowledge for the outlay of our time, money, and, and efforts in an experiment. Algorithms can work this out for us. We run the experiments, and we feed this back. This process can be and is fully automated in a number of key studies around the world. This is about choosing intelligently clever places to look to observe the world. It's like choosing a favorite chocolate from a chocolate box where you uh, have to work out what the next one is going to be without seeing the back of the box. And the kind of way it works, I'll do this very, very quickly, is to intelligently decide where you want to take an observation. Imagine you have to pay every time you observe the world around you. It's in your interest to make payments with the smallest number of experiments as possible. And algorithms can tell us where, when, and what to observe to give maximum knowledge to our theories and our surrogate models of the universe around us. And these very naturally find interesting places in the data, and they help us work with these things. So they're used in everything from automating the process of building the physical substrate of quantum computers, which I bet will be a subject of a Higgs lecture at some point in the near future, because they are the next really big transformation. But importantly, they can be used in order to create things that have lifelike properties that are able to do certain things. This is from a great work by a guy called Jeff Kloon in the University of Wyoming. And after a few iterations of these algorithms that intelligently try out policies of how to walk, you end up with something that trots along like a happy doggy, which, of course, is a very good thing. This is absolutely transformational. And it looks like the dawn of a new era. However, as always with any new technology, there are a few elephants in the room. The first elephant, and I was particularly proud with the cute elephant up here, um, data is crucial. And yet, we spend very little time on the not sexy end of AI, which is how we ingest dirty data. If you have a jet engine, the data you get from sensors is not clean and beautiful. Trust me, it's really dirty. Real scientific experiments, noise is way bigger than the signal. Again, we need to worry about how we deal with this. Bias is rife. You train algorithms on one data set, it finds things which are compatible with the kind of data it's already seen. The only thing you can do is flag up things that it goes, I'm, this is weird, it's not like what I've seen. That has its place, but it isn't really a useful forwards going uh, technology. The world is dynamic, and most of the models that we've been discussing, most models that you see, are push refreshed. The algorithm that allows my phone to uh, understand my speech and to operate when I talk to it is going to be updated on a semi regular basis by whoever creates that algorithm. It's not constantly adapting to me. Witness the difficulty if you've got a really bad cold, and you say, OK, Farron, it, it kind of doesn't understand you. So we need systems that are evergreen, and they adapt to the world as it flows past us. And model choice, architecture, and settings are often chosen by human algorithm designer bias rather than being scientifically chosen. I bet lots of people, when they're meddling and playing with AI will have maybe tried out things like deep learning algorithms. How many layers should I have? What should my nonlinearities be? What should the size of these convolutional units be? The questions about the 
inner parameters of algorithms are often not really discussed. Yet these are as important as the way in which we create solutions in their own settings. So, why don't we use AI to create AI algorithms? Given that computers are replacing us, why can't I do myself out of a job? So, let's think about the throughput of what a machine learning expert does. She looks at data and she says, hmm, this data's really dirty data. I really need to clean this data and perform some operations on it to enhance the information content. Then she says, now this data looks really similar to stuff I've seen before. Uh, so this is a little bit of a clue. Things I've seen before means things that I've observed in the world and I've imbued into my model for things that work, algorithms that might work, given particular kinds of data sets. Okay. Last time, a convolutional neural network worked brilliantly for learning a representation layer. And then a support vector machine on top of that gave me a lean, clean, high-performance output with some error bars. This is the kind of thought process we all as data scientists go through. We may need to do some dimension reduction. We may need to do some clever manipulation of the data. But every single step of this can be fully automated. We can have algorithms that are specialist algorithms that learn about the dirtiness of data and learn how to take it from its corrupted, gappy, grubby form that we get from the world around us and turn it into something lean and clean, which is the right format to put into the next stage. That next stage is going to be the choice of some kind of algorithm armed with a particular piece of data that looks very similar in its characteristics and what we want to do with it compared to data we have seen before, we have a warm start that certain categories of algorithm are likely to work more than others. We can then get the answer out. We can automate this entire process. And there's quite a few people out there doing this. Auto AI, auto ML, self-driving AI. The stuff obviously I'm most familiar with is the stuff we're doing in our spin-out, but this, irrelevant of any commerciality, this is an amazing technology that can ingest. It can come up then with models. Furthermore, it can write the code. Does it produce answers better than me as an individual? You bet it does. Does that frighten me? Kind of. I'm wondering how long I'm going to be kept in the company that we started, uh, because I think the algorithms are definitely taking my job. But this is an exciting time. The reason being is these algorithms don't come with my prejudice, which is to say, Bayesian is best. Everything is a probability. Uh, let's compute for a month at a time and do the right thing mathematically. These create pipelines of solutions which are geared towards maximizing the value of a user. This we normally refer to as the automated data scientist. I think more truly it's augmenting data scientists. It is taking away the 80 to 90 percent of work that data scientists, human data scientists, should not end up having to do. Endlessly going through several hundred columns, changing values, writing code to do low-level work, and so on. Most problems can and are being automated. So, we sort of end up with this incredible production line whereby we can have an AI system that is learning about how to create AI algorithms given data. Data comes in at the bottom end. Many different algorithms along the assembly line are assembled. And what pops out is a deployment, which is then written. This is kind of frightening, but wonderful at the same time. This is about robots making other robots. It's about AI creating, in some cases, new algorithms to solve particular problems. I can't help but be excited by that and slightly concerned at the same time. 
So in the last few minutes, what I would like to do is maybe give a little bit of a flavor of where I think things are going to change enormously with the transformations that are apparent with AI. The first thing, of course, is that it is replacing human work. There's no need to dig into facts and figures. These are well established from everything from World Economic Forum, OECD, governments and beyond, that algorithms are beginning to replace people in a variety of areas. Some of these areas we know, and it's not the kind of job necessarily that a person would want to do, because it's going back through back episodes of Dad's Army or whatever, and annotating everything that's in every frame. Algorithms now are better than human beings at taking in an image and saying what is on it, maybe except for a parrot on a bicycle um, from earlier. Other things, like translation, they're not perfect. There are other translators available other than Google, but Google have put a huge amount of work in. We all know it gets it comically wrong from time to time. But by and large, you can read a menu in a foreign country by pointing your phone at it. And it gives you an augmented reality overlay in your language. That's magic. It's incredible. And it's only going to get better from here. Machine learning is automating the legal profession. It was only summer last year that the first case went to court where the case notes had been created and compiled by an algorithm, not a legal clerk. They are good at sifting through millions of pages of precedent, of detailed, uh, almost algorithmically annotated, detailed legal case notes from the past and learning about what strategies were incredibly effective in similar cases and advising barristers about how to prosecute or defend a particular client. This is a technology which is in its infancy, but it is happening right now. Accountancy. Accountancy is a very human subject, we think, yet at its core it is highly numerate, and it is being automated. Many people will use an algorithm rather than a person in order to perform their accounting tasks. Again, this is something that I think is going to absolutely transform the accounting profession. Logistics, everything from healthcare right the way through to the logistics of manufacture and consumption, all the way through to these enormous 100 ton and beyond trucks that are completely autonomous, that are running around in open cast mines in Western Australia. There's nobody driving these. They work in an intelligent environment where they offload everything in an automatic way. Again, most science fiction films have led us to believe this will happen, normally dystopically, and it is happening right now. The rise of autonomy at a, an urban environment really is just waiting for changes in infrastructure and changes in legislation. Cities like London could in the conceivable future, and I'm sure it will happen in the next decade, ban vehicles driven by people from inside a perimeter ring. The taxi that you take in a decade's time will not have a driver in it. What are we good for then? We're still very creative. Algorithms can't supplant and surpass our creativity. They are not yet able to transfer their knowledge about one domain in as effective a way as we can to a completely different domain. And we are still really good at social intelligence. Very big AI companies and researchers have been trying for several years to get algorithms to work to cooperate and compete in multi-agent environments. This is something that we learn to do 
from birth. The moment we socialize, we're very good at forming friendship groups. We're good at working together to solve problems. We're good at playing games against teams of other people. And yet algorithms, for all their power, are relatively poor at performing these kind of uh, tasks, which involve social intelligence. However, the future. These automated intelligence systems are able to review data, extract meaning, automate the process of taking new data from the universe around us, understand that data to find low-dimensional representations like laws of physics, and it can, they can do it at scales that we can never do. If we, as human beings, continued to do science till the end of the universe, we would not be able to do as much science as our algorithms can inevitably do. It is to do with the scale that they can work at. So I think, whether catastrophically or rather excitingly, in science, industry, and much of commerce, the era of human intelligence is ending and has ended in some fields. And the era of the algorithm has very much begun. So I will partly end there. But those who are slightly maybe shocked by that statement, there is one reassuring slide. If algorithms learn from historical data, that was surprisingly easy. How come the robotic uprising used spears and rocks instead of missiles and lasers? If you look at the historical data, the vast majority of battle winners used pre-modern weaponry. So I will end there. The robots aren't quite taking over yet. And thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you very much, and watch out for the cowboys.